Welcome to another episode of Get Paid for Your Pad. And today we're doing part two of a three part series on really understanding like how do our SDR Legends members, how did they grow their businesses? How did they become so successful? We're trying to pick the essential elements. So for everybody out there who's small and who wants to grow, they can take a shortcut and, and learn from those uh, lessons. So today I'm super excited. We're going to talk about the, uh, the management model with Mr. Logan Humphrey. He's the CEO and founder of Coho b and And also he founded the Short-Term Rental uh, Alliance in Arkansas um, for advocacy. Right. So we're going to talk all about this. Logan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jasper. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited, man. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about your business before we dive in. Yeah, definitely. So um, I got started by being a Get Paid for Your Pads biggest subscriber. <laughs> no, I was uh, back in 2015. I had uh, I was basically uh, about to start grad school, and uh, I worked for a local coffee shop, and they cut summer hours because all the students left town. And I was thinking, you know, how do I how do I how do I make money? And I was like, well, I can't, my car's too old to put up on Uber um, because they have a, a, an age limit or something like that. So, well, I could just, you know, rent my apartment out. And so I, I threw it up on Airbnb, didn't know what I was doing. I, you know, I was laying in bed and had a guest who booked at 11 PM while I was reading in bed for that night. And uh, I was like, oh my gosh. So I like frantically cleaned the place, got it ready, met them at the door like 45 minutes later. And, uh, you know, they ended up having a great experience. But uh, from that moment, I, uh, I, I realized, you know, hey, this is a lot of fun. And uh, so I saw this as uh, not only being fun, but a great way to make some um, cash flow. So I basically, I basically started by renting my apartment out every weekend. I'd go camping. I'd stay with friends, I'd sleep on their couch. And, and then I, uh, after about three months into doing it, uh, I decided I was gonna buy an RV and live in it full time. And so for two years, I had a full time apartment. My landlord didn't know about it. Um, and at any moment I was like, I could get evicted. You know, I could just get evicted. He could just, I could see a letter and, and it could be, that could be the end of it. And so, uh, you know, two years, two years into doing that, I was like, wow, this is, this is awesome. And so I started, um, you know, that was when the co-host marketplace was a thing on Airbnb. So I kind of uh, started shopping around. There were some people looking for co-hosts. And then I started helping a couple friends out. And, uh, you know, from there, I mean, we just kind of, I just kind of started co-hosting anything and everything. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the, from there, I mean, we, we, we just kind of took off, but, uh, so that was around 2018. Um, it was right when I was about to be done with grad school. And uh, what I did during that time period was uh, I realized um, this could be a lucrative business model, you know, co-hosting. And uh, so, I mean, it was, it was friends. It was word of mouth. It was the reviews that my property had being on Airbnb. I mean, I had like 100. And, and when I was in the marketplace and got started, I was in a town uh, I'm from Fayetteville, Arkansas, and uh, the the town basically had 75 to 100 properties, maybe maybe less than that. And so I heard people that would reach out to me or try to get in contact with me because you're like, you have 75 five star reviews, or and you know how how are you doing it? And and so I just picked up everybody's property. It was people that lived there full time and just wanted to rent it out on the weekends, you know. And I I co-hosted their property, and uh, you know 2018 we ended the year with about three properties. And then by the end of 2019, we had, I think 42. So within uh, that one year, we grew about 40 properties um, just on the co-host business model. Um, and so, you know, half of those properties were people that lived there. They were, you know, half inactive. They weren't even full-time rentals. And so at the beginning of 2020, which is actually the year I consider you know, year one, I consider this year, year one for my company, kind of um, from a professional standpoint. Uh, on January, I think it was January like 13th, we just overnight decided to terminate about 13, I think it was 13 or 15 contracts with our homeowners because they were just not, you know, within our, our new business model that we, we pivoted to. 
So we dropped down to around 23 properties. I think at the time it was 23 or 25 properties. And uh, these were some of our, you know, B, A and B players. Uh, we got rid of all of our C players that were, you know, part-time or, or, you know, different ways like that. And then we really focused this year on becoming a professional full service property management, like vacation rental company. And so, you know, since then to kind of come back to the landlord, I, I, I approached the landlord and I was like, Hey, here's what I got going on. Um, I'd love to have all these other vacant units. And he was so excited. He was like, Oh, this is so cool. This is great. you take better, you take, you pay your rent on time and you take so good care of the property. And so we ended up getting uh, around three more units in there. We've got a, a fourth one on the way. Awesome. And I, I love that you mentioned how you scaled down first in order to scale back up. Cause that's something that uh, Chip Conley mentioned when he was in our mastermind. And this, this was before you joined but he, uh, that was one of his advice was, um, you know, like, you, don't be afraid to scale down in order to scale up. And then we were getting a lot of questions around that because people were saying, oh, that doesn't make sense. Like, if you want to grow, like, it doesn't make sense to, you know, to shed units first. Um, but it, it definitely makes sense, right, to focus and, and really establish your brand and going after uh, the type of properties that, that fit your brand. So I think that's, uh, that's really interesting. Um, I'm excited, man. I, I have a lot of questions for you. I really want to understand, yeah. you know, what were the key drivers to success? You know, what would you tell somebody who's just getting started? What are some of the mistakes you made? So let's, uh, let's dive right in. So let's start with the, the what, what is the number one thing that you're doing in your business now that you wish you would, would have started doing from the, from the beginning? Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, you know, I think the number one thing that I would do, you know, that we're doing now that I would, I would completely change or, you know, have started earlier doing was, you know, really developing a business plan. If it was one thing, it was developing a business plan with, with implementing strategy. So, you know, I, I had written down here, you know, developing clear and expected policy. Um, there was, especially this year, we've had uh, quite a bit of turnover because I, we were growing so fast and we had so much operational demand that, um, you know, I, I didn't know exactly what to do. I, I would just put some context here. I'm in a market where there's one other competitor and everyone else is uh, basically, you know, all of the closest people that are around are a couple hours away. We, you know, we, we, we're pretty, we're pretty isolated. We're, uh, you know, we started off urban and then we went to kind of more rural as we time went on, but, you know, cl developing clear expectations and, and expected policy from my, my staff. Um, there was kind of a joke that someone had brought up at one point that, uh, you know, we're in the South. And so, uh, you know, Christianity is a big thing down here. And, you know, those WWJDs, what would Jesus, what would Jesus do bracelets that people used to wear in like the, 90s and 2000s well there was a joke of uh you know they would say like what would logan do and and uh i i kind of you know it was more of a joke but i realized you know having people that kind of ha having team members that didn't really know what to do they basically had to ask me to do everything um you know that was something that had to change and i wish that i would have early on i would have been like okay you know m what do I want to, what do I want to set as policies specifically around like bookings? I mean, you know, should we give discounts? Should we not give discounts? Should we, how should we deal with a party that was done in a housekeeping manner? You know, all these different uh, uh, policy expectations. And at first we just kind of picked them, picked and choose and kind of handled them, whatever was like in an intuitive response. And uh, I realized uh, I realize now, and in fact, I'm still, you know, this is still something I'm working on trying to get right, that uh, most things can be systemized and put into processes where we can follow specific policies. I mean, it's very rare that you find something that can't be put into a system. Yeah, hundred percent. And we were just talking about systems before we started recording this. And uh, when I first, first saw a system, I was thinking, man, like, I need to put in all this extra time to like document what I'm doing. Uh, I don't have time for that. Like I have stuff to do, you know? Um, oh, it's so I'm, hard. It's so hard. <laughs> yeah. But I'm totally on the same page with you. Uh, 
now I have a system for everything. I have a system for recording this podcast. You know, <laughs> I know he had me follow way too many rules. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet man. Yeah. Um, awesome. That's a, that's a great one. Um, so if you were to start over, that's something that you would have done differently. What, what is, um, what is like the biggest obstacle that you faced in your business and how did you overcome it? So the biggest obstacle I faced was having some impeding expectations from the state to be a professional brokerage. So when I first got started, I was really doing illegal property management. I mean, I was just co-hosting was, I mean, the name of the company is Coho b and I mean, we, 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 I built it up as a strictly Airbnb co-hosting company. Um, I realized, well, first of all, I realized, you know, that, that if this is kind of like a property management asset class and I had no idea, I mean, nobody, there was no, there's literally no company that's a professional property management company that manages short-term rentals that's near me. And so I was not aware of that. And then, um, I had had a couple of people tell me that as we got bigger and bigger, they were like, well, well, do you have your real estate license? And I was like, no, do I need to? And I was like, wait, why am I asking this person that? So I looked into the law and I asked my attorney and, and I realized that, um, you know, we needed to become a professional brokerage and, and that's really what set 2020 aside. So that's the moment we opened up, we became, we moved from Coho b and to be Coho b and properties because we had to have a real estate signifier in our name. Um, and in 2020 that, you know, that's, that was the big jump for us. That was when it was like, okay, you know, I decided to commit to being a professional property manager. I'm not just someone who just managed a few properties here and there, turning this into like a full-time scalable enterprise. And, you know, the, the hardest obstacle was really finding a good business partner that had a real estate brokerage license. And it took me a while. And not only did it take me a while, but also the fact that the state could have shut me down or, you know, could have done all these different things. I, I was, this, it was about this time last year that I was like freaking out. Um, <laughs> you know, end of 2019, I was like, oh my gosh, we got to get this going because they were potentially looking at cracking down on some of this, these uh, developing policies around, you know, short-term rental property managers, um, things like that. And so, you know, once we did that, it was a whole new lesson. I had to learn how to file, uh, do brokerage files. I had to learn how to have real estate contracts. And, and, and there was this uh, kind of a big jump in a learning curve there, but it really allowed us to jump to the next level in a practical way. So it wasn't just being able to comply with law. We also were able to collect rents legally. And, you know, when before we were just kind of charging a fee and the homeowners got all the, the rents from Airbnb direct deposited. Um, now we were, we were able to get on multiple platforms. We're able to have our own website. We're able to collect um, homeowners money so that we can pay them out. And in our specific state, if you collect any money or you manage any property, you have to have, you know, you have to be a, a brokerage. And so we, uh, when we became that way, uh, I mean, I watched this year, I look back at the revenue we generated in 2019 and, and we've almost with just doing, being listing on uh, Verbo and a bunch of different channels, which I'm, uh, I'm on, on the, the, the side of the fence of uh, being on as many channels as you can for marketing purposes and brand awareness, especially if you're, you know, marketing your brand and not necessarily marketing like your name. So like, you know, an Airbnb market, like, you know, hosted by Logan. Well, that doesn't help you unless you're saying like hosted by Coho b and with your logo there if you're on a bunch of different channels because the goal of a channel is to get them to book direct. And so I was looking at, uh, you know, the second time they come around book direct. Um, I was looking at revenue and uh, we did from when we were at 100% Airbnb this time last year. Um, so far as of, you know, as we made this shift, we're at 51% Airbnb. 30% Verbo home away. And then the, the rest are actually 20% Verbo home away. And then uh, 20, 20, 25% uh, direct booking, which is pretty, which is pretty great for having less than a year of uh, time to have our website together. So, uh, you know, really making that jump and figuring out how to be not just an Airbnb co-host, but actually kind of switching Brands, I kind of liken it to how Airbnb was airbeds, and then they went, wait, we want to do chalets and full luxury villas and things like that. 
uh, it's, it was kind of that jump in my company when I decided to take things, take myself and take my team and everyone more professional. Awesome. And you, you know, you mentioned brand. Um, and I'm curious, like, how, how did you determine your brand and who you want, who you want to serve? <laughs> Oh, this is funny. I, I, I had knee surgery and, you know, when, uh, when in 2018 and, uh, you know, this is kind of how we built the name and the logo. And I, you know, they, I think they, they gave me, I don't know if it's hydrocodone or what exactly, but I, I basically that first night I had some crazy dreams. I've never had crazy dreams like this. And I had a client who was kind of the, the boho, uh, you know, SoCal, uh, she talked a lot like that by shortening things. And she was telling her uh, father, uh, or either father or father-in-law in the dream, you know, she was like talking about how great her co-host was and how much she loved it. And she was like, you got to get a coho. And I woke up and was like, holy cow, here's that moment. And I was like, wait, what is a coho? That sounds really familiar. So I looked it up and it was a salmon. And if you see our, uh, if you see our logo, it's kind of a loopy, uh, kind of playful version of a fish, but most people don't really know what it is. They think it's a dog. They're like, is it a fire? I have no idea. And then when you say to them, it's a fish, it's like, you can't unsee it. But the, the idea behind it came in a dream. I bought the domain that day and I realized, wait, let's make this like playful, interactive. And, uh, you know, we've had a ton of people from a brand perspective be like, what's your logo even mean? And I ask them always, every time, what do you think it means? Because that's really all that matters is that they're thinking about my brand and not necessarily me answering the question for them. And so like, that's from like the building of a brand perspective. But when I build like the way that we want to market our company and we want to market our brand, um, I learned really, really quickly that uh, we, you know, we, we have to chase after the high income producing properties. I mean, that's something that I would go back and change. You know, I would, one of the biggest, another one of the biggest things I would do if I started again was uh, start analyzing revenue, like using sites like AirDNA and analyzing revenue um, to chase after the properties that generate something that's going to uh, turn a profit. So that's kind of putting the profit first mentality um, and not necessarily getting more properties. You know, at first I was just taking on everything. And then uh, I decided, wait, we need to focus on things that are profitable. So that's when I terminated them all. But actually, even recently, it, I, it, this is a really recent development. I have been diving into the numbers like crazy, looking at what our operating expenses are. You know, what is it? If every property we bring on, what's the average, you know, cost that, that this property brings to us? You know, not only the, the subscriptions of software, things like that. And so... You know, from a brand perspective, from acquiring ho homeowners and partners, uh, I, I'm, I, I, I realized like, okay, you have to set your minimum. Like if you run it on AirDNA and, you know, you know the market that's in there and you trust the number that AirDNA pops up, it's not like a new market. You have no idea if this is accurate or not. Uh, set your minimum and stick to it. I mean, when you bring on a property or maybe a homeowner that's not a good partner, they don't fit within your, your you know, your, your culture. Um, you are setting yourself up for failure. We had, we've, we've lost a lot of homeowners that when on reflection, they probably would have never been, they should have never been brought into our brand in the first place because it wasn't going to be a good fit from the beginning. And, you know, really focusing on what your brand is, focusing on the type of people you want to go after. I mean, maybe you want to go after people that are like, they, they like, for instance, we're in a mountain biking town. Maybe you want to have homeowners that you can go mountain biking with. Maybe that's really valuable to you from your perspective because, you know, every day it's not necessarily just about the money. It's also about, you know, loving the people you work with and the people that you deal with. And uh, I learned really quickly. We actually just terminated a, uh, a contract. We've only had a, lost a couple this year. And, you know, we've grown a, a whole lot this year. Um, I actually just terminated one because, uh, the homeowner wouldn't let me have price freedom. And now I've, I've realized this is a huge value for a company is having price and freedom. You know, there's a level of trust involved there, you know, telling your homeowners, Hey, you know, trust me, trust me. I, I, I've got your best interest in mind, especially if you offer uh, operate on a revenue share model where you're not like fixed fees per booking or stuff like that. 
If you're on a revenue share, you're like, trust me, I want your property to be well taken care of. I want the pricing. I want to maximize revenue for you because if I hire, if I bring in a bad guest and they throw a party and we have to shut the place down for two weeks, that hurts me. I mean, it hurts you a little bit more, obviously, because you're the homeowner, but it also hurts me too. And so there's a level of trust there. Like I'm going to screen the guests, but maybe this season, the price needs to be dropped a lot. And those homeowners uh, that don't necessarily fit within your brand, you know, I look back on that and I'm like, I got to focus on what properties generate revenue and what partnerships I want to have with my um, homeowners. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That's super important. And um, you touched on, on quite a lot there, but yeah, that's, that's in a, that's something that we see across, you know, the, the mastermind as well um, across all the, the legend members that's something that they really focus on, right? Is, is not just bringing on as many units as possible, but really understanding like who, who you are, who you want to serve, um, what's your brand. And, um, and we actually, we did a training on that a couple of weeks ago when I uh, had about 200 people show up. So it's definitely a topic that people love to, to discuss as well. And, 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 and for the right reason, because it's extremely important, and especially now, you know, with COVID, there's, you know, travelers have more concerns um, and also they're traveling local. So I think their expectations are a bit higher. You know what I mean? Like when I, I go, if I travel to New Zealand, like I'm just excited to be in New Zealand, you know, right? Like I, I, can, I can get a, a room with a bed. I'm happy. Right. But <laughs> I go like, you know, half an hour from Barcelona where I live. I want something special. Right. So, um, so yeah, I think that's great, man. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what is, what is one thing that you think was absolutely crucial to your success? Well, you know, without it being sounding like I'm doing a paid plug here, joining the short-term rental legends group. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, for real though, uh, th things that I have been so crucial is, is just finding people that know more than me. I, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't have a business degree. I was working on a graduate degree in philosophy. I loved critical thinking and having visions. And I've got, you know, I love teaching students and I was going for the academic route, but, you know, I studied some of the great philosophers like uh, Tony Robbins and, and all these people. I, I joke because they're like, who'd you study in grad school? I'm like, Tony Robbins. <laughs> but I really did. I, I studied, uh, you know, I, I studied value-based propositions, you know, working on building a valuable life and like, you know, those classic meaning of life answers. And, and, you know, I, so I didn't have a business, I didn't have experience in business. I mean, I worked in an office job. I did door to door sales for a while. Um, I mean, well, if I came back to like a practical aspect, get into door to door sales, that, that was probably the biggest, even before a college degree that, I mean, that like really shaped the way that I was able to be comfortable with taking no's, you know, literally going up to homeowners and selling them and following up with them 10 times for them to say, stop bugging me. Uh, I don't want your services and not taking it personally. I mean, you know, getting, so like getting involved with a mentorship and then just getting your feet, you know, getting your feet dirty, getting out there, hustling, um, the, you know, you know, being comfortable with people telling you you're, you know, a POS and that you're, you know, you're, you're bothering them or something like that. And then, you know, take a lesson from that too. You're like, well, maybe I shouldn't be so aggressive and then pivoting and, and adjusting and, and uh, I mean, just, just, just working hard, finding a group of people or someone to mentor you. Um, I'm still looking for mentorships, you know, all the time. Uh, I, you know, we have, we have uh, 40 properties right now. Most of these are three bedroom plus when, you know, a year ago we were mostly like two bedrooms and one bedrooms. Um, and so, you know, learning, trying to find someone that's, that's able to like help me teach me business. I mean, that's been, that's been something that's been absolutely crucial. Uh, I've been, you know, just asking and connecting locally with people that know business better than I, but also finding a group of people like the legends or, you know, listening to get paid for your pad or, or things that's able to give you a fresh perspective because we get so, I get so caught up in, you know, literally I'm getting Slack messages and text messages right now that, you know, I, I have no, you know, sometimes I can get so caught up in the day to day that I forget to take a step back and, and, and work on myself, work on my business, um, you know, continually grow. That's been, I think that's probably been 
one of the, the most crucial elements to my success is, is, is constantly seeking out to renew myself and to, you know, refresh my attitude towards certain topics. Awesome, dude. Awesome. I love that. And uh, I'm a big Tony Robbins fan as well, by the way. I went to <laughs> his uh, UPW and I went to his Date with Destiny and say hi. <laughs> <laughs> do, do the jumping around like crazy. I always think it's funny seeing the videos. I'm like, man, yeah. everyone's just, he's teaching a workout class if you weren't listening to the, to, <laughs> to the topic itself. I know. It's, it's funny, man, because uh, I remember taking some videos and showing those videos to people who are not familiar with Tony Robbins. And I would say like, what do you think this is? And most of them would say, is that like a giant nightclub? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like the silent nightclubs. Everyone wears headphones. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it's great though. I've learned a lot from him as well. And uh, I love philosophy too, by the way. Yeah. Um, the, the Stoics, those are my, my favorites. Yeah, definitely. Those, those guys, I mean, really, and so, I mean, some advice for people that are listening, like, look into that there's philosophy for anything. And some people think it's just this highbrow understanding of, uh, you know, asking these major questions. But truly, like, it's the act of philosophizing that really is what makes it successful. You're, you're going through these processes to expand your mind and it's not necessarily solving them. That's kind of the point of philosophy is it's, it's uh, if it becomes solvable and quantifiable, it becomes a science. Uh, you know, philosophy of mind became psychology and it became something that's studied uh, empirically. But, uh, you know, pushing your limits and asking these questions. I mean, I'm glad I did it at a young age because most people do this at their midlife crisis and they start asking these major questions. And, you know, at a young age, I was like, okay, I realized they're not solvable. I learned a lot of skills. Now I can go to work. <laughs> but for real though, like taking that time. Um, you know, uh, Tim Ferriss is a huge, huge motivator that's contemporary for me as well. Like, uh, you know, he wrote the book Tribe of Mentors and, you know, just reading all this advice from people that are much smarter than me and even smarter than him. Uh, you know, just give their little feedbacks of wisdom. Everyone has a little bit of, you know, contribution they can make to the, to the pile of what we call knowledge. And that's a, that's a great way to end this episode with all that wisdom. Um, thank you so much, Logan. Um, if people want to stay in Fayetteville in Arkansas, uh, t let them know where they can find you. Yeah. So, you know, the best way to find that is to go to cohobnb.com. That's C-O-H-O, -O, like co-host. BNB as in like airbnb.com and uh, you can see all of our properties you can book direct uh, if you want to follow us on Instagram we're very active there and uh, you know we take marketing very seriously uh, as any property manager should uh, and so uh, you know we, we always are involved with people on the Instagram as well Sweet. And uh, you want to mention your uh, alliance as well in Arkansas? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so like, you know, we recently uh, have been dealing with some regulations in our area. Luckily, we're in an area that's, uh, you know, favorable for short term rentals. But, um, you know, if anyone's interested in, in uh, joining our alliance, I'm also the, the president of Arkansas short term rentals dot com. Um, for anyone that's in Arkansas that may be listening to this, please join anyone that's not and just interested in following along what a city can do. You're welcome to join as well, but, uh, we're advocating for responsible renting and, uh, responsible regulation, um, for short-term rentals. Awesome, man. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for your time. And it's great to have you in the, in the legend mastermind, man. It's been a, it's been a blast and, uh, to your success in the future. I'm excited to see, uh, where you're going to take this. Yeah, thanks, Jasper. Thanks a lot for having me today. Absolutely. And to the listeners, thank you for listening. And uh, next week, we're back with uh, part three of the, um, of the case studies of the SCR Legends Mastermind members. So we've done the ownership model, we've done the management model. So next time, we're going to talk about the master leasing or the rental arbitrage model. So thanks for listening. Until next time. See you guys.